have Jill Utter from BASF. Um, she's the horticultural representative for them, and she's going to speak about their chemical profile. Hand it over to awesome. you, Jill. Thanks, Nicole. Everyone can hear me all right? Awesome. I will share my screen here. And we'll get right into it. So I'm not going to take up too much of your time today, I promise. I know these virtual meetings probably you've been in a couple and they're long, but we'll get through it today with some exciting new stuff from BASF. Um, so first here, I thought I would just throw up the chemical profile. Uh, this is the 2020. Obviously, we've had some changes going into 2021, and I'll talk about that a little bit this year. I'm sure most of these brands are extremely familiar to most of you guys. I mean, we picked up Ignite from Bear back a couple years ago, um, and we've had most of these products products in the polio for quite some time now. Of course, Versus being somewhat new, that's our aphicide. Um, Sevia was our 2020 launch, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, and then I'm going to continue with a new brand for this year. Okay, so Sevia. We launched this product back last season, uh, and it went over really well. Uh, it's got a good fit in different chemical programs, depending on what groups you're using. So kind of an exciting one. Um, so the active ingredient here is Revisol. Um, it was registered in Canada and the U.S. last year, and we've had some MRL updates this year, which is awesome. Um, and that was the initial launch label. So today I'll focus in on palm fruit and stone fruit um, for some of you guys that have those crops. Kind of three key attributes to this product. So the first being that we see fast and continuous control of those keys, uh, especially in, in apple and stone fruit, which I'll we'll talk about today. Um, so this graph here shows the rapid uptake of the product into the leaf. So what we find is that we're seeing that immediate uptake, which makes it extremely rain fast. And then it sits in these inner reservoirs in the leaf, um, which it slowly then translocates out to the end. So here's the graph here that shows that steady continuous translocation out to the end of the leaf. So what we see is that the whole leaf is protected for an extended period of time over some of the other group threes in the market. There we go. Second key attribute for this one. Um, of course, we want that on as a preventative, um, just in terms of control and for resistance management. But with it being a group three, it does have a little bit of post-infection control. So we'll talk about that a little bit. I mean, we, we saw this in apples last year as well. And it is great if you get caught, you know, in a rain period uh, where you've had an infection period that you're just having an option to be able to apply something. Um, this is the trial that was done in grapes uh, pre-launch. And what we found is it does have some really good post-infection control. So kind of the last, but certainly not the least, most important factor on this fungicide. Um, so it is a group three, but it does have kind of this unique binding activity. So we're seeing no cross resistance to other group threes on the market. And of course is a great option, you know, with resistance developing with group sevens, nines and elevens. So what makes it group three? It is absolutely a C14 dimethylase inhibitor, which is like other group threes on the market. But what makes this product a little bit differently is that it kind of has this different action in terms of binding. So what we see if with a lot of group threes on the market is that they're continuously kind of grabbing and letting go of that site of action. Whereas Sevia actually has this isopropanol unit, which is the, the orange yellow unit there, which actually allows it to flex and hook onto the site of action, which kind of locks it in there. There's kind of a nice little visual video there showing you that flex and exactly what it can do. Awesome. So there are again, kind of those three key attributes to this product. Really good uptake, which makes it rain fast. Sits in those inner leaf reservoirs and slowly translocates out so you get that continuous control of scab and powdery mildew and it does have that isopropanol unit which allows it to flex and hook onto that site of action. 
So again, kind of that initial label crops, uh, focusing in on palm and stone fruit. The initial label was apple, scab, and powdery mildew. Um, the label does say suppression. Uh, they just applied for controlled powdery mildew at the high rate in the states. So something to keep an eye out for, um, as well as they have registered some summer diseases. So we continue to look into that as well. Again, really good on apple, apple scab, on leaf and on fruit scab as well, um, especially up against some of those really awesome products in the market. And just a, a quick touch on stone fruit here. So there's the, uh, the labeled diseases. Um, it does have some really good activity on, on brown rot. Um, and there's some other products in the market that allows that to be a really good rotation product. So there's that brown rot control, you know, against Circadus, some of the other um, competitors in the market, it does a really excellent job. It is a liquid. Uh, the pack size is two by four liters. Um, MRLs have been established now for US, Mexico, Brazil, Australia, and Japan. Um, you absolutely can use surfactants with this product, uh, but coverage is key. It's not completely necessary. It's kind of up to you. Um, and of course, always mix with that non-group three for resistance management. Again, we had some really, really great Growers try this out this year. I think some people on the call have also tried some Sevia out. Um, I mean, it's it's an awesome product. It's it's a really nice group three. It rotates well with sevens and elevens and some of the other products in the marketplace. Um, and we saw it work on some really, really heavy pressured scab blocks in Ontario here. Okay, moving on, Maravon. So this is the new launch for 2021. Um, I kind of like to call this the new pristine. Uh, it's similar, but different. So we'll get into that in a minute. Most of you have probably heard of Maravon, especially being at the Great Lake Expo. I mean, this is their prime scab powder mildew product in the States. Um, and you've seen probably different trials and different researchers talk about this product. They love it. So what makes this different from Pristine is the, is the group seven. It's a different group seven. So instead of Cantus or Boscolid, it has the semium fungicide or what you guys probably know as Circadus. So again, it's got that group 11, group seven. Um, it's highly systemic, it's rain fast. You know, you still got that excellence benefits with that group 11, um, but it's, it's a systemic with that new group seven and it moves right through the xylem. So this will be the initial labeled crops for Maravon. Again, we'll focus in today on palm fruit and a little bit of stone fruit for those of you that grow. Now this is from Michigan University, obviously a really great visual there. It really is their prime apple scab product down there. So there's a trial. Again, this is all data from Michigan State University that we stole for some of our presentations here. You know, up against some of those standalone group sevens, it still has a bit of a leg up. It's also really excellent on powdery mildew. And this is where Maravon, in my opinion, has a bit of a leg up on Pristine. Um, Pristine and, and Maravon are very similar in terms of summer disease control, you know, post-harvest disease control but it really shines when it comes to those early season scab and powdery mildew. So initial label here, it is very similar to the pristine label, apple scab, powdery mildew, bitter rot, black rot, frog eye leaf spot, fly speck, sooty blotch. Um, they've set up the label a little bit differently, but it's still very similar to the pristine label. So same PHI and re-entry period. Um, there is a bit of a, asterisks in terms of the label with um, methylated seed oil or crop oil concentrate. So what we what they found in the states actually was the majority of their trials was fine, but they did see a little bit of crop injury on one specific trial in the states. They have not been able to replicate that. With that being said, you know, there's always a risk of crop injury with some of these oils mixed with Maravon. You know, the wrong combination of weather and that mix. 
So stone fruit here, it absolutely has a bit of a leg up on pristine in terms of brown rot control. Um, so something to keep an eye out for if you're growing peaches or stone fruit. Really good on cherry leaf spot. I mean, of course, Luna Sensation is great as well. It's out there in the market for, for brown rot and cherry leaf spot, but um, Maravon in the States has done a really excellent job. We've grabbed that data from there. So there's the initial label there for stone fruit, um, really focusing in on that brown rot and cherry leaf spot control. And I believe PHI and re-entry is again, and St. Pristine for stone fruit as Maravon. Kind of just an overview of that again, uh, group, group seven, group 11. So similar to Pristine, but that group seven is the difference, it's the circadus that's mixed in there. Um, so again, extremely rain fast. You're, you have that broad activity on in terms of disease control. And I think that is it for me. We'll open it up for some questions. So when you ask questions, you can ask them and you have to open up your, uh, you have to unmute yourself or you can also type into the chat if you don't want to talk. Hi, Freelm. It's Brian Rideout. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Hey, Jill. Um, I know you're not the one to answer this question, but maybe somebody from Lakeside. What's going to be the pricing on Miravon, you think? I can, I can take a stab at it. I mean, the uh, Lakeside crew will have a bit of a, a more accurate um, number for you, but it is, it is more competitive with your early season scab and powdery mildew fungicides. Okay, that's a really broad answer. Uh, I know. <laughs> coward. It's cheaper than uh, for apples. The other question was, um, so is it for scab infections and stuff like that, is it better to go on early, early season, or can it be go on anytime during the season in apple, apples? Yeah, it can go on anytime during the season for apples, but really in terms of, you know, its, it's difference from pristine, it is better early season. No problem. All right, it looks like we have some questions in the chat. Um, what's the acti what's Sevia and Mary Vaughn's uh, post-infection activity? That's what Ian Yeah, so Mary Vaughn, you definitely want that up front. It's a group seven, group 11. So not a lot of post-infection activity there. I mean, that group seven will have a tiny bit of reach back, but really with Mary Vaughn, you want that up front for sure. Um, Sevia, we'll talk about three to four days reach back. I mean, the earlier, the better, um, but it does have some more flexibility in terms of post-infection control. All right, next question is, uh, what's the rain fastness on Sevia? Yeah, we, the label says an hour, but really once it's dry, you're good to go. Um, and then will pristine be phased out eventually with uh, Miravon? No, we are hoping to keep pristine. I've asked the marketing people this as well. Um, it's labeled on some crops that Miravon is not, uh, specifically some of the brassica crops. Um, with apples, it won't surprise me if Miravon kind of takes the majority of that market um, just because of its activity in terms of it's very similar to pristine on all of your summer diseases and it's better on scab and powdery mildew. So I think in this marketplace you'll see more pristine but or more Maravon but we will continue with the pristine label as well. Any other questions if you guys want to unmute yourself or put it in the chat? Awesome. Um, we use pristine, um, a lot of growers use pristine close to harvest or as close as possible to harvest for storage issues. Uh, yep. What about Maribon in that situation? Yeah, they're so very similar um, label registration to pristine in terms of, um, sorry here, I'm just trying to get out of the doc. Um, so it actually should be the the re or the PHI is five days for hand harvesting. So I believe that's the same as the pristine label. 
Um, with that being said, if, I know that there's certain processors that have their own stipulations, and that is because of the paraclostrobin. So it'll be the same as pristine. Another question. Um, can you use oil with Maribon? Is it safe? Yeah, so there's that stipulation on the label that says, you know, methylated seed oil and that concentrate oil, um, they've seen some some crop injuries. So that stipulation is always gonna be on the label. With that being said, they haven't seen it in the past five years down in the States, any issues. Um, so I would say it's fairly safe, but just watch out in terms of, you know, really hot weather or really cool weather, just, you know, watch watch that application period. Brady. Awesome. Anyone else with questions? It looks like that's it for Perfect. questions. Okay. Awesome. Well, I'll stick around just in case anyone has any other questions, but really nice to see everybody. I hope everyone's doing well. Thanks again, Jill. We really appreciate Thanks you coming on. Yes, yeah, good to see um, people. Um, <laughs> I'm a little bit tired of the Zoom meetings already. <laughs> Hope we can see each other soon. Now the next um, uh, is main speaker is Rick De Young from Agro K, and um, Rick De Young he lives in BC, and uh, but he comes every month or so um, to uh, Ontario and visiting. Uh, farmers and us, and um, I met him um, a couple of years ago, and uh, I realized he has a wealth of knowledge, not just the product, it's the wealth of knowledge, especially in apples, and uh, it keep, he keeps me, uh, impressing me, and I'm working with him uh, uh, a lot on the SAP sampling um, point of you and um, so we quite frequently talk and I think that's a, for the benefit of us all and so I invited him to speak on two parts and the first part is the SAP analy analysis and um, Rick you better introduce yourself a little bit better than I did introduce <laughs> you. <laughs> well first of all good morning I hope everybody can hear me it's great to be here. Thank you for, for the, the, the introduction there, Friedhelm. Um, I'm a gra I graduated uh, from University of the Fraser Valley out here in BC back in 1990. Um, that's when my fertilizer career started. So I've been doing uh, crop nutrition since 1990. So boy, that does date me. And as I'm sitting here thinking, that's, 30, that's, that's 31 years. Um, and 26 of those years now, uh, very specifically with tree fruit as well. Uh, I do cover a, a host of different crops, but tree fruit is a crop that I've been involved with and palm fruit uh, since the mid 1990s. Um, I am the international business development manager now for, for agro -OK Corporation. I've been with the company just shy of six years and the last year and a bit uh, as their international representative based out of British Columbia on the other side of, uh, of the country uh, where it's still dark outside. <laughs> um, anyways, Friedhelm asked me to talk about SAP analysis this morning. And uh, I, this is something that I'm quite passionate about. It's a newer, newer tool, tool and Hopefully, after, by the end of this quick presentation, you'll have a bit of an appreciation to why I get excited about SAP analysis and why I think it's a pretty neat new tool to put in the tool belt with some of the other things we are presently using as a nutrient management tool. So let's get into this. Um, whenever I start a talk on, on plant nutrition, I have to start with the, the five R's of plant nutrition. Uh, these are what I consider fundamental principles when we're planning and, and, and making 
making arrangements to, to meet the crops, plant nutritional needs. Um, and they are right nutrient at the right time, right form, right mix, and right place. And I do want to spend a, a brief few minutes kind of visiting these just to give them all each a little bit more context. So when I talk about the right nutrient at the right time, what I'm really talking about is making sure that we're committed to providing the, the, the key nutrients that the crop needs when the crop needs them. Um, and then I ask the question, are we succeeding? Are you, are you meeting the needs of the crop when those needs arise? Right form and right place. And what I mean by that is from a right form perspective, it, there are different forms of the same nutrient. I'm sure you've all heard of urea and ammonium sulfate. Uh, nitrate, nitrogen, uh, polyphosphate versus, versus orthophosphate. There's a number of different forms of nutrients that are in the marketplace. And some of them excel very well for foliar uptake. And some of them are much better to be applied to the soil for root uptake, whether it's through a fertigation program or granular or a combination of fertigation and granular. Um, some of them are better applied on the soil. Some of them are, are more, more apt at penetrating the leaf for foliar application. Um, because quite frankly, you've got to get it into the crop before it can help the crop. And I do see a lot of foliar products that are applied um, that maybe should have been applied to the root zone in the fertigation program instead. Um, just because a, a fertilizer is perhaps in a liquid form, um, such as ammonium thiosulfate or potassium thiosulfate, um, or in a water soluble that I can dissolve it in water and actually spray the leaf, like a 105210, doesn't mean those products are going to penetrate the leaf properly. Um, so we do want to make sure that when we, we're buying a fertilizer, that we're buying the right form for the application, whether that application is through the fertigation uh, or through the leaf or as a granular product. Um, and we also want to recognize that we want to make sure we're putting nutrients in the right place. Um, and to me, that has a, a double meaning to it. Uh, when I say right place, uh, it's a first, uh, first off an acknowledgement that these key macronutrients you need to be putting them through the root system, whether it's through a fertigation program, a granular program, a combination of a granular and a, and a uh, fertigation program combined. But those key macronutrients, the base needs for those macronutrients need to go through the root system. Uh, the micronutrients that are needed in much smaller quantities uh, do very well on a foliar program. And certainly on a foliar program, we're trying to take advantage of windows of opportunity to enhance things. Um, also, depending on where the nutrient ends up, um, does have a play in how it's reacting within the plant. Uh, so for instance, zinc, if I put zinc in the fertigation program and I'm putting it into the root zone, into the roots, we're gonna help grow better roots. If I foliar apply zinc, we're gonna help build vascular tissue and make big leaves. Um, so using the right forms of the various nutrients to ensure that the right nutrients are in the right place um, is a commitment that we have with the five R's. And simply put, are the fertilizers you're buying and applying actually getting into the plant? Because again, if they're not, they're not going to work. Right mix. Now, here's what I mean by right mix. There are, there are both nutrients that have nutrient synergies with each other and nutrients that have antagonisms against each other. A good example of a nutrient synergy would be calcium and boron. By simply putting the two of them together when we apply them, we're going to increase uptake of both of them. And some research has suggested 10 to 50 percent increase in uptake by having a little bit of boron with the calcium and vice versa. Um, there's antagonisms that we want to be aware of so we can avoid them in the tank. And a good example of that is the potassium calcium antagonism. During fruit cell division, when we want to get calcium into the fruit, we got to avoid high potassium levels. 
So are we doing a good job utilizing the different nutrient chemistries that are, that are out there to improve that fertilizer efficiency? So there are the five R's of plant nutrition. And the more precise and accurate we can apply these five R's, right nutrient, right time, right form, right mix, right place, the better the outcomes at the farm. The more efficient the use of your fertilizers, so you're not wasting money, and the better the crop yields and crop qualities are going to be. So there's certainly some, some return on investment if we can apply these principles better, more accurately. So here's a few questions um, to think about. What if you could identify nutrient toxicities and deficiencies before the symptoms are evident in the crop, before you see that deficiency in the leaf? What if you could be proactive with your fertilizer program, but not guess? What if you could know the current levels that are available for optimum development within the crop right now, today, and tomorrow? Well, the, the, the neat thing now is we can. I can answer all those questions in the affirmative. Um, and what's allowing us to do that is this new tool, this analytical game changer called SAP analysis. Uh, think of SAP analysis very much like a blood sample for plants. And it is indeed, when you combine it with the soil sample and you, you do a fruit analysis at the end of the year, this is providing new insight uh, and actually challenging some longstanding principles of plant nutrition, which is pretty cool. Um, it is definitely a different approach to monitoring nutrient uptake. What we're doing is we're taking leaves off the tree minus the petioles, we don't want stems, just the leaves, and the lab analyzes the sap content from inside the leaves. Um, there are very specific sampling protocols, like what I just alluded to, the stem is eliminated, no petioles, just the leaf. There's some timing to when the samples need to be taken and where on the, where on the tree we wanna pull those samples. But as long as we're, as long as we're following those precise protocols for, for, for sampling, we're getting accurate, precise, science-driven results. So we are able to get very accurate results, precise. So we're getting good results over and over and over again. Um, this is a much different approach than a tissue sample. In a tissue sample, I like to say what we're doing with a tissue sample is looking a little bit backwards. Because if you think of what a tissue sample is, it's analyzing that entire leaf, including the leaf dry matter, the leaf tissue. And a matter of fact, a significant portion of that sample is leaf tissue. Um, and most of that leaf tissue uh, has nutrients that are tied up. So those are nutrients that are no longer available for the crop moving forward. So that's why I say we're looking backwards a little bit because we're all, the majority of the sample is leaf dry matter that's already tied up. Another point with doing just a conventional tissue sample is it's getting the whole leaf, including what's on the leaf. And remember what I said earlier, if it's on the leaf, it doesn't help. It's gotta get into the leaf. Um, and that's what we wanna look at. Um, there's roughly, typically in the average tissue samples that I've seen looking at, 13 different data points. Uh, I say the, the information coming off is more general data in, in parameters. And that's because when you do a tissue sample, you're typically taking it from around the middle of the new growth. Um, and if you have nutrients that are more mobile in the crop versus less mobile in the crop, you kind of summarize that picture versus taking a look at, at both ends of old and young leaves separately. Now a sap analysis, is looking forward. And the reason I say that is we're now getting rid of the majority of that, well, we're getting rid of all that dry matter, roughly 80% of that tissue sample is dry matter. We're getting rid of that dry matter 
and focusing just on the sap within, within the leaf. So this is measuring nutrient content that is not tied up in leaf tissue. It's available for the crop today moving forward, which is why I say it's a bit of a forward looking. Uh, we are looking at 23 different nutritional indicators, all the way from sap pH and sap EC to silica, even aluminum, and all the different forms of nitrogen as well. Um, it reveals nutrient imbalances before they're really visible because we are sampling old leaf and young leaf separately. Uh, and that allows us to capture the nutrient mobility uh, and what's happening is as nutrients that are mobile are getting stored in older leaves to be pulled up into the younger growth later. Um, we do need when you're doing sap analysis to have specific target ranges. We're not just comparing differentials between old leaf and young leaf. We have specific target ranges for apples um, and for a number of other crops as well. So with sap analysis, we're gaining new knowledge. We're getting it in real time, in a, time, in a good timeline. It is accurate. Uh, we can be precise as well. So we are getting a better understanding about how to meet the crop's needs and we're doing that consistency. And because we're getting it precise and accurate, we're wasting less fertilizer and we're maximizing those crop input return on investments. So we're wasting less money. We're able to focus on what we need versus guessing and do more of a shotgun approach and spending money where we don't need to be spending money. So the company that, uh, that I have uh, been using a lot, and there is, they are independent, I have no take, uh, they're not connected to AgroK, is a company called Nova Crop Controls. They're based out of the Netherlands. The reason I've gravitated to Nova Crop is first of all, they are leaders in SAP analysis. Uh, they're the ones that figured out how to get precise and accurate data on various crops. And they've also the ones that have developed optimum nutrient ranges for a multitude of crops. Uh, so they've got the established protocols. They know how to do it. They're getting consistent results. They've got the targets. They're based in the Netherlands. Hopefully uh, sometime in the next year or two, they will have a lab available in Canada or at least in North America. So reading a report, um, when we start getting into these reports, and you'll see on the, on the right there in my picture, uh, we've got light green bars and dark green bars. The light green bars are the young leaf. The dark green bars are the old leaf. When we're reading a report, we have to start off by, by realizing what the plant is trying to do. And the plant is always trying to regulate the new growth first. Um, and if there's a mobile nutrient and it has a need in the new growth, it will pull it out of the old leaf and move it up. If we have an immobile nutrient, like say calcium or boron, it can't move it up from the old leaf. Uh, those are nutrients that aren't moving with the sugars. When we look at the report with the graphs, you can see we've got three sections there. The first section represents deficiencies. The optimum range is in the middle and the excess is on the right. And depending on where we are in the plant's physiological growth stage, we can move around between the, in that optimum range for, which has quite a little range there. Um, the amount of nutrient needed uh, to maintain the targets will change through the course of the season. But what we do know about SAP is the nutrient optimum levels don't change. So depending on the time of the season we're, we're in, if we're in an early season where the potassium demand is quite low, we may only need a little bit of potassium to maintain an optimum level. Where later in July, we may need a whole lot of potassium to maintain that same optimum level. But the neat thing is with SAP analysis, the optimum target range remains consistent through the season. And what changes based on the plant's physiological growth stage and from rootstock and variety to variety and rootstock um, is the amount of nutrient to maintain that target level. This is why we sample old leaf and young leaf separate. There are more mobile nutrients and less mobile nutrients. And by, by, by looking at them separately, we can identify, for instance, if we have a high phosphorus in the old leaf, 
and adequate or low phosphorus in the young leaf, the crop will actually pull that phosphorus out of the old leaf and move it up. These are things we would not be seeing if we had sampled near the middle of that new growth. Um, so by doing it separately with young and old leaf separately, we then get a better picture of what's actually going on. So the neat thing about sap analysis is because the target levels remain relatively consistent through the season, uh, we can do sap analysis at any point during the growing season, as long as we have fully expanded and functioning leaves to, to sample. Um, so we're looking for the old leaf to still be functioning and a young leaf that is fully expanded. Um, we do have very specific sampling instructions for various crops, including apples. If sap analysis is something you're interested in and you want the protocols for sap analysis, certainly uh, the team at Lakeside can, can, uh, can make sure you have what you need to get going. When we start looking at sap analysis and the movement of the mobility of nutrients, we also look at the balances between those nutrients. Fertility is about balancing the different nutrients. Um, here's a little chart that I like that shows the, the balance between the macro cations from calcium to a monocle, uh, and then the balance of the macro anions from nitrate, sulfur, chloride, and phosphorus. We have a group, the group of micros on the bottom left from copper, zinc, manganese um, that really compete with each other as well. And then we have the less competitive nutrients on the right for the micros, boron, moly, and silica. So when we're going through a SAP sample, this is the type of chart that I'd have in front of me to help me understand the, the balances and interactions between the different nutrients. Everything within a quarter competes with itself, with each other. So you've got calcium, potassium, and magnesium competing with each other. And then there are synergies as we go uh, across to each other. For instance, the calcium and boron would be a synergy. Um, so within each quadrant, there's some competition. Um, would like to spend a few short minutes talking about silica. It is a non-essential plant nutrient, but it is part of the cell wall structure. It gives rigidity to the cell wall structure, but we need to be careful if we're applying foliar applications of a non-organic silica because it gives rigidity to the cell wall structure, but if that rigidity, but it can also make cells brittle. Uh, and when we get brittle cells, we can get more problems around fruit cracking later in the season. Essentially that, that cell will lose its elasticity and stretch. Um, so a lot of work needs to be done on silica. I would caution you if you're doing foliar applications of silica, uh, be measured. Uh, don't overdo it. I have seen excessive applications of silica lead to fruit cracking and other fruit quality issues. Um, the neat thing about a sap analysis, we are monitoring silica. It is captured within, this, within, the, within the sap analysis. Um, the one drawback here with what we're looking at is it's not distinguished between organic silica and inorganic silica. And the reason I say that is because organic silica doesn't seem to, we don't seem to get too brittle in the cell structure if it's organic silica, which would be coming out of the ground. Silica is abundant in the earth's crust. Um, it needs to convert to an organic acid for the crop to take it in. This is driven through soil microbial activity. And so when we look at the silica levels in the sap, um, it will give us an indication to root health and soil health, because if silica is readily abundant in the earth's crust and it's that organic, it's that organic uh, digestion that's releasing silica by converting it to an organic acid, and then the roots have to bring it in. So if we've got good silica levels in a sap analysis, that tells us we've got good soil biology that's active, and converting silica to an organic acid. And I, got a, I have a solid root system to pull that silica in. So silica in the sap is a bit of an indication to root health and soil health. Um, one of the other things that is caught in a sap sample is the nitrogen cycle within the plant. Most people I talk to are very much aware of the nitrogen cycle in the soil. We put down urea, it will convert to ammonium and nitrate. 
but there's a second cycle within the plant. And that's where nitrate, if your nitrogen comes in as nitrate, it will convert to ammonium and then over into amino acids. Uh, nitrate is a luxury feeder. If it's present in the root zone, it's coming in whether the crop needs it or not. And it will pull water in when it comes in. Ammonium, NH4 positive, doesn't leach as readily as nitrate because the soil has a negative charge, ammonium has a positive charge. And ammonium will come into the crop as the crop needs it. And then it builds it into amino acids and off we go. So we've got a nitrogen cycle here that we wanna be monitoring. And the neat thing about sap analysis is we do monitor it with the sap analysis. You will capture your ammonium, your nitrate, the amount of N coming from that nitrate so we can compare it to the total N. So there's your whole nitrogen cycle. Now, what the heck is that total nitrogen? Well, the total nitrogen in the Novacrop sap is, is all the organic and inorganic N. So the total nitrogen is looking at the nitrates, ammonium, if there's any residual little bits of urea around, although most of the inorganic will be nitrates or ammonium, and then any nitrogen present as amino acids and proteins. So when nitrates come in or ammonium comes in, it builds into amino acids and proteins. There's your organic N. So we are actually with the sap looking at both inorganic nitrogen and the organic nitrogen sources. And in a cold spring, to give you an example of why this is important, in a cold spring, you might be getting nitrates coming in because if it's there, it's gonna come in. Um, and the crop may be able to metabolize it into um, ammonium and then into an amino acid and protein. But we'll see in, the, the, in a cold season, it, we'll see buildups of that organic nitrogen. So you'll look at a sap, your nitrates will be nice and low, your ammonium will be where it should be, but your, your total N will be off the charts. And that's because we're getting the buildup of total N coming from those organic nitrogen sources, from those amino acids and proteins that are not being metabolized by the crop because the weather's cold. And then all of a sudden things warm up, those amino acid and, and, and proteins are utilized and metabolized and the organic nitrogen comes down, bringing the total N down. So the SAP analysis is really allowing us to monitor and, and work with the entire nitrogen cycle within the crop. Uh, one of the things we want to be careful of is with the nitrate N. And this is why they break out N in nitrate so we can compare it to the total N. If, if you start getting close to 50 or 60% of your total N coming from nitrate, we know you have an increased disease and insect susceptibility risk. Uh, and this becomes even worse if you have low sugars because the leaf function isn't there. So you certainly want to manage your nitrate nitrogen. Very high nitrates uh, cause problems, bring insects, bring disease. Um, and I'm not saying if you bring your nitrates down there, you're not going to get any insect and disease. That's not reality. But certainly those pressures go up when we get higher nitrates within the crop. We want to see those nitrates coming into the tree and cycling into, into ammonium and then over into amino acids and proteins. So this is my talk on sap analysis and why it's kind of important. I touch base on a few key points. Again, there's 23 different indicators on SAP. If SAP analysis is something that you're interested in, some of you may already be using SAP analysis. For those of you who aren't, we're certainly here to work with your Agrimart team to make it happen. There we go, Friedel. Yes, thank you so much for your first part. And um, yes, if you are interested into this SAP, um, we can, of course, help you. Uh, to get started or uh, uh, because it's quite the protocol is quite um, it's not like uh, we are used to from the tissue sample we just go and do it right no there's a little bit more as Rick earlier mentioned and uh, it has to be done early in the morning before nine o'clock for starters and um, you need quite a bit sampling done uh, so uh, if you're interested you can certainly talk to me and Nicole, because we went through that process quite a few times already. Anyway, now open for questions, either in chat or in, um, and we have here one, what is the average turnaround time for a SAP oh, analysis? That's, so, that's, a, uh, that's a very good question. 
I can I can answer that for you, Rick, because you're in Ontario, right? <laughs> um, we have on Fridays we take them uh, early in the morning, and uh, we send them it off with um, um, FedEx, I think it is, yes, um, in the afternoon, and we had results back by Tuesday or Wednesday, depending on their workload over there. So it, it goes as fast as then a, a um, sample from the uh, um, uh, from the, 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 the tissue sample. I want to say sorry. Okay, I hope that answers that. Uh, we are going on and keep more. Let's talk apples. <laughs> let's talk apples. Um, for for the second presentation. And if there are questions, unfortunately, at the end of this presentation, I, I have to leave. I have another presentation I'm, I'm providing right back to back with this one. Um, so if there are any questions at the end of the presentation, do make sure you ask them. And if they don't get asked and you think of something tomorrow, by all means, reach out to your Lakeside team. They all have my contact information. Um, and can easily get a hold of me to make sure your questions get answered. I, I like questions. Uh, there's no such thing as a silly question, so don't be shy either today or through email uh, in the next day or so. Um, so yeah, thank you for the, giving me the opportunity to talk about apples, freedom, and <clears throat> crop nutrition as it relates to apples. Um, as a reminder, um, as I go through today's presentation about apple windows of opportunity, Apple Nutrition very specifically. Uh, keep in mind those five hours of plant nutrition, right? The right nutrient, yeah, five hours of plant nutrition, right? <laughs> right nutrient at the right time, right mix, right form, right place. And the better we can apply these fundamental principles, the stronger the fertility program, the better the outcomes, the more efficient use of your fertilizer products. I've had cases on apple crops where um, by applying these five R's better uh, with things like sap analysis that I spoke about earlier, um, we've been able to literally shave hundreds of thousands of dollars off of fertilizer programs um, for nutrients that were being over applied and not needed. So really, if you're, if you're looking at fertilizer efficiency and wanting to make sure that you're not wasting that fertilizer dollar, uh, really focus in on these five key principles using things like soil sampling and, and sap analysis. So growth stages. And um, I, I was listening earlier and I, I, whenever I listen to, uh, to, the, uh, to the, 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 the chemical companies uh, that bring their pesticide products to the market, which are great, we need these products, but I see them often referring to different growth stages. This is the insect pressure window uh, you know, at this physiological growth stage, we, ex we expect to see this disease. Uh, these insects show up at this physiological growth stage. Well, you know what? Growth stages are not just for pests and disease management. They're also for plant fertility. Um, this is part of what I mean by right nutrient at the right time. We need to understand the plant's physiological growth stages and the roles of the different nutrients within those different growth stages to ensure that the right nutrients are there at the right time. Um, so really want to see this used for growth stages, for, for nutrition, not just for disease and insects anymore. So here's a, here's a kind of an opening question for the group this morning. Um, actually this afternoon, I do believe, my apologies. Um, nope, still morning. Um, when to apply that first foliar nutrient application and when to apply that first soil-based fertilizer? Well, from a foliar nutritional standpoint, um, I have a tough time recommending foliar nutrients if there's no leaves. I see some, some uh, companies out there will tell you to put that first foliar spray on at silver tip or green tip. Um, myself, I'm looking for bang for buck return on investment. Um, and that means you got to have leaves if you're going to do foliar. So my first foliar recommendation typically starts in around tight cluster. When, that, when, when those fur leaves are really starting to open up 
and there's actual leaf material present, to me, that's the beginning of the foliar nutrient season. From a soil basis, and this is whether you're applying granular or fertigation, uh, or hopefully a combination of at least both, um, we need to have soil temperatures. And the, the, magic, the magic range is around five to seven degrees Celsius at a couple inches of depth in the soil. So from a, a root feeding perspective, I tell growers, get yourself a soil temperature probe. And when that soil temperature in around that two to three inch depth is, is starting to push five to seven degrees Celsius, now you can start feeding the root system because now you're gonna have an active root system that's able to pull nutrition in. Before that point, before we get those soil temperatures, fertilizer is just gonna sit. And unfortunately, if you've got a fertilizer, the nutrient that can leach, it's gonna leach out of the profile before the roots are even active and awake and able to start feeding. So five to seven degrees Celsius is that magic point that we wanna see before we start working that root system. So early season, what do we see early season? Well, from bud break into that tight cluster, so tight cluster, early season, what, what do we see? We see that formation of those, those, those fur leaves and the beginning of leaf development. Um, so during that time, what are some key nutrients that we need to be aware of? Well, we should be thinking about, about nitrogen and phosphorus for sure. Uh, nitrogen to, to, to help support that leaf development. Phosphorus is the energy behind cell division. But we also want to make sure that those leaves are functioning, those photosynthetic nutrients. So magnesium, iron, zinc, and manganese all have roles to play in photosynthesis, and we want to be paying attention to them. And very specifically, and I'm going to explain why in shortly, but magnesium is a critical one for early season. Uh, so keep that at the back of your mind, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But magnesium Early season, a tight cluster, really, really important and often deficient at tight cluster. So once we get through into pink and now we're at pink and we're moving into early bloom, well, now the tree is no longer so worried about or that early leaf development. The tree is starting to think about pollination, fruit set, and fruit cell division. So at this point in time, certainly, Boron is pretty key. Uh, boron plays a very good role in flower health. The health of that anther tube is critical in boron. Uh, boron has a huge role to play in pollen viability. And for good fruit set, we need viable po pollen. So boron has a pretty key role to play. And this is the time when we really want to start ramping up that calcium um, to get high calcium into our apples. Uh, so we need to start ramping it up now. And remember, when I was talking about the right nutrients earlier, I talked about synergies, right mix. Well, one of those key synergies is calcium and boron. And the neat thing is, you can see by this window, they're both needed at the same time. So if putting them in the tank together, or putting them, uh, applying them together is going to create a synergy, and they're both needed at the same time, that's a pretty neat opportunity. Note the nutrient that's missing here is potassium. The crops demands for potassium and tree fruit right now are very low. And we want to see ramping up calcium for fruit cell division to increase the calcium in the fruit. If we had a lot of potassium at this early time of the year, it will actually inhibit the uptake of calcium and the movement of calcium into that fruit. So potassium needs right now at this early time of the year are quite low. Now, as we move from, 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 from bloom and fruit set to petal fall, now we're in that key window of fruit cell division. Um, and this is the time to put calcium into the fruit. So really at this point in time, the key thing that the crop is thinking about and you should be thinking about is calcium, calcium, calcium. If your first foliar calcium spray is later when the fruit is roughly at ping pong ball size, uh, you've missed the opportunity to put calcium into the fruit. The key window of opportunity to move calcium into the fruit 
the primary window of opportunity to move calcium into the fruit is during fruit cell division, which lasts from fruit set to four to six weeks post fruit set. At that point in time, we want to be putting on lots of calcium. Now, how many calcium sprays do I do? Really depends on the variety. Uh, varieties like Gala, Ambrosia are very efficient at pulling calcium up through the root zone. So we'd still want to put calcium out, but we don't need to be as aggressive. A variety like Honeycrisp, uh, which is a true problem child with bitter pit, which can be helpfully addressed with calcium in the fruit, uh, needs more frequently. The other key thing to remember when I'm doing my foliar calcium sprays at this point of the year um, that drives how many applications I should be doing is the weather. Um, we're augmenting whatever calcium we can pull out of the root zone. So we're pulling calcium up through the root zone. Calcium's coming in with water. Calcium moves with the water. It doesn't move with the sugars in the, in the tree. So it's coming up with the water. In a wetter year where we've got good amounts of soil moisture to come into that tree, as the tree has transpiration and respiration, it pulls more water in, pulls the calcium in with it, as long as that water's there. In a drier year, where we don't have as much water to bring calcium in through the root zone, we need to be spraying more frequently. So the amount of calcium sprays you do are dependent on the variety, but also dependent on the weather. Drier years, you're gonna to need to be more frequently, spray foliar apply calcium more frequently in a wetter year you might be able to get away with a little bit longer um, and then of course from a, one variety to the next as i've been saying so you've got to be a little bit adjusting on the fly and this is where a sap analysis helps guide us on what we're seeing in the in the tree because it's going to give us a picture of what's available for calcium in the sap today moving forward for the crop um, so it does help give us a guide but we know during that petal fall, from petal fall to four to six weeks post fruit cell or post petal fall, that's the fruit cell division window. We want to be really, really focused on calcium in this window. Once we get four to six weeks post petal fall, now the game changes a little bit. We're, we're pretty much ending the end of fruit cell division. The end of that window of putting calcium into the fruit and note and i'm going to go a little bit more in depth shortly on this but note i'm making the comment in the fruit um that this is our window to get calcium into the fruit now at this point we're moving from fruit cell division to fruit bulking so this is where all those cells that were dividing and growing that we were wanting to get calcium into and ensure earlier than that, that we had some phosphorus for cell division. Now those cells are beginning to bulk. So the remainder of the season, when that apple is really gaining in size, that's no longer cell division, that's cell bulking. And one of the key ways we do that is with sugars. And we want the movement of the sugars that are being produced through photosynthesis. We wanna see those sugars moved into the fruit. Potassium helps with the movement of those sugars. So now we're getting into an area where we want to be thinking potassium for sugar movement, for bulking that fruit. Now, calcium can't be forgotten, unfortunately. It plays a little bit of a different role with the foliar applications now. Once we're four to six weeks post petal fall, the calcium sprays we're applying are no longer putting more calcium into the fruit. But during that post petal fall period, we get a lot of new leaf and shoot growth. That, those are all cells that are forming that need calcium. And we want to make sure that those calcium needs in that new shoot growth are being met. Because if they're not, we'll create a pressure that will pull calcium from the other sinks. Unfortunately, one of those other sinks happens to be the apple that we just spent a whole bunch of money putting calcium into. So by putting on calcium maintenance applications post fruit cell division to support that new leaf and shoot growth, we're keeping the calcium that we put into the fruit earlier in the fruit. Uh, so calcium is still important. The demand for calcium sprays at this time though 
is a little bit less. So where you need to be more aggressive with the intervals of how often you're applying calcium during fruit cell division, during fruit bulking, we can pull back a little bit. Um, and what really guides how aggressive I need to be at calcium at this point is how much new growth I'm getting, because that new growth, again, is new cell formation. Those cells demand calcium. So if, if, if new growth is a little bit slower, then we need, we can put on less maintenance applications. If new growth is a little bit more aggressive, then we may need to be a bit more aggressive on those maintenance calcium sprays. And then the weather factor still comes into play. If it's wetter, we can get away with a little bit of a wider gap between sprays. If it's drier, we need to be a little bit more aggressive with the interval between sprays. So we can't forget the calcium, but we need to realize that, that at this point, the calcium is, is more of a maintenance to keep calcium in the fruit versus putting more calcium into the fruit. So as we move through the season, we're now into late summer. Uh, the tree has slowed uh, with growth, but photosynthesis is kicking into high gear at this point. This is where we see some significant changes in apple size. Uh, and I saw some data recently out of the states that had different varieties and rootstocks showing how different varieties the, the apples size differently from earlier to later, but there's still a, a significant amount of apple size being driven at this point, and the demand for potassium is great. Now, another thing that potassium does beyond moving sugars is it helps regulate the moisture within the tree. It helps regulate the opening and closing of the stomata on the leaves, which is essentially how that tree breeds. So it plays a key role there through those hotter summer days as well. But magnesium is also, and iron is also important at this point because we need that photosynthesis and the movement of sugars. And this is typically a time, depending on your soil pHs, if you have fairly closer to neutral, so six, five to seven or even higher in soil pHs, this is a period where we have a huge demand of magnesium and iron and a window that I usually see as deficient for these two key nutrients. Um, you can do foliar applications and certainly with, with, with uh, the magnesium anyways and potassium, uh, fertigation is a nice way to put these nutrients out at this point in time to really focus on what we need. Um, so as we move from late summer into fruit color, and I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about fruit color um, because there's, there's been a debate out there that I've certainly been part of and enjoyed the conversation around, which is, do I use potassium to give me fruit color or do I use phosphorus to give me fruit color? And simply put, both have had success, but let's dive into it a little bit so we can understand why and which one you may wanna consider using at your specific farm in your orchard. So potassium or phosphorus for color, which one should I use? Well, first of all, let's get behind the science a little bit. Let's embrace a little bit of the science here. Um, the key group of pigments driving color are called anthocyanins. It's the anthocyanins that give the apple that nice deep red color. They are formed from, an, from amino acids and are very sugar dependent. So if they're sugar dependent, that's why potassium plays a role because potassium helps move sugar into the fruit. So the, the higher the sugar environment in the fruit, the better those anthocyanins are going to be present in the fruit. Now, because they are amino acids, these amino acids, one of the key building blocks is phosphorus. So phosphorus is a key building block to the amino acids that we need for the, for the anthocyanins. And that's why phosphorus has a role to play in this as well. So potassium helps move sugars into the fruit to create an environment of high sugars in the fruit, which is necessary for anthocyanin production. Phosphorus is a component within the anthocyanins, a component of the amino acids. So both have key roles to play. And here are some of the factors that address those anthocyanin productions. Again, variety has a huge role to play. Whether is the biggest, by all truth, whether it has, a, has the huge role to play. Um, plant stresses also have a role to play. A tree that is under stress 
will actually want to reproduce faster and will start pushing more sugars into the fruit. Um, tree nutrition and crop load have a role as I'm, I'm talking about and plant growth regulators can also play a role in that we see ethylene production as a way of, of enhancing or inhibiting color. Um, and by the way, as we start getting more into color, if you've been applying seaweeds, particularly foliar applied seaweeds, uh, particularly the nodosum, uh, Ascophyllium nodosum, actually reduces, impacts ethylene production and can slow down the ripening process. So if you have been applying a lot of seaweeds and you're starting to get into color, you want to be backing off and, and, and taking those seaweed foliars out of the spray program uh, once you start getting into color because you don't want to inhibit ethylene production and, and fruit color. So do I, do I go with, um, I, the weather is mother nature, light and temperature, um, which trigger the anthocyanin production. Once we've triggered that production, we can now play around with either phosphorus or potassium. And which one do I use? Understanding what both do, um, SAP analysis would tell us. Uh, I have many regions where I work with apples where late season we use potassium for fruit color. And the SAP analysis shows us that at that time of the year, we tend to be deficient on potassium. Some regions of Ontario though, have way more than adequate potassium. And a matter of fact, late season, as we're getting into fruit color, and you look at a SAP analysis, potassium is not deficient. In some cases, it's actually quite high, uh, even to levels of toxicity. And at that point, once we have high SAP levels of potassium, so high potassium within the tree, applying more potassium to dry fruit color just is silly. It makes no sense. Um, it's not gonna impact to put more potassium in a crop that already has more than adequate potassium is not gonna drive color. But in those situations, we need to evo evaluate the phosphorus levels. And if phosphorus levels are low in the sap, by it certainly ensuring that those phosphorus levels come up, we're gonna drive color that way. Because again, phosphorus and potassium both have a role to play. Um, from a weather perspective, we are looking for a few cool nights. We can help drive fruit color, but we have to wait till the tree has triggered fruit color. We can't create fruit color through nutrition. Um, we can certainly create stresses that might get the tree wanting to drive color uh, through moisture management, but that's not advisable. We typically wait till we start getting some cooler nights with some nice afternoons where the temperature's getting up a little bit, that's gonna trigger the production of anthocyanins. Now we can come in with our phosphorus or a potassium based on what something like a sap analysis is telling us and what we know from history in the field. And now we can drive that anthocyanin production and enhance fruit color. So we can use nutrition to enhance it, but we don't use nutrition to trigger the fruit coloring. Now, here's a little bit of a statement I wanna make, and then I'm gonna explain it. So this is a key statement. There's a direct correlation between early season spur leaf function and fruit color. And that comes back to what I mentioned earlier and underlined early season at spur leaf development and magnesium. There's two key windows for anthocyanin production. The, the, the one that we're all quite familiar with is during that final fruit maturity that I've just been talking about but there's a second window and it happens at the end of fruit cell division. That's where we can look at the, as the table being set for fruit color. So that early season spur leaf function, um, right around the end of, at the end of fruit cell division has a role to play in color late season. And at that point in time, there's a direct correlation between magnesium and that early leaf function and fruit color at the end of the year. So you do not wanna be deficient at that early season uh, on, on magnesium. So here are the windows of opportunity. Uh, we move from a, a period of early leaf development to bloom into fruit set. Um, and one of the things I've found during fruit set when we're really focused on calcium, 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 and making sure there's a little bit of boron in there early in, in, the, in the bloom window, I, 
I tend to see very poor responses to those photosynthetic nutrients at that point in time. So going on with a magnesium during fruit set um, or an iron during fruit set, I've been often very disappointed. And I believe that the, the, the crop is in a fruit set mold. Um, it's not building leaf function uh, at any real significant level. But once we get beyond that fruit set and we petal fall, we see a flush of new leaf and leaf development and vascular tissue development. And this is where I come in hard if I'm low on magnesium or iron or something. Then we move through that fruit development, that fruit bulking period of time into fruit ripening and then late season winter prep. And that is a very important window. I realize on some of those later, later apple varieties or on a late season that kind of extended the picking window, um, you may not always get your post-harvest spray in. But remember what I was talking about, the importance of that early season spur leaf function? Well, we set those spur leaves, leaves up by what we do post-harvest. Um, and if we can, if we still have decent leaf function after those apples get off the tree um, later in September, if we can go on and put something on as a post-harvest application, uh, particularly to evaluate whether or not I need zinc and boron, those two can play a huge role in how those fruit buds over winter and how well that leaf function is coming out in the springtime. And that drives next year's fruit color. So don't forget that post-harvest. I realize that's not always practical on those later varieties and from one season to the next, but it is critical if you have that opportunity to do it. One of the things I do wanna to touch on briefly before I wrap up my talk is fruit analysis. I like to refer to fruit analysis as the final report card. Uh, we use soil sampling to kind of set the stage and figure out what we've got in the soil to work with. Um, but that doesn't necessarily, just because it's in the ground doesn't mean it gets into the tree. So utilizing sap analysis to tell us what's in the tree, what came out of the ground and what the crop has to work with from a nutritional perspective to grow that nice crop. And then at the end of the year, hopefully within a couple of weeks of har before harvest, we go out and we do a fruit analysis. That tells us how well we did. That's that final report card. Um, and you know, you're trying to get more calcium into the fruit. Well, if you're not measuring how much calcium you're getting into the fruit, how do you know when we're doing better? So here's what a fruit analysis could look like. Um, this is one um, where I've taken the data coming out of uh, a &L Labs and put it into a little bit of a different Excel spreadsheet um, to, to see what we look for. One of the key things I look at at a fruit analysis are the different key ratios. These are indicators to how well that fruit is gonna store, whether or not we're gonna have internal breakdown issues, soft fruit issues, and just general storage issues or not. Um, so we're looking at things like nitrogen to calcium, potassium to calcium, magnesium and potassium to calcium, zinc levels, phosphorus levels. When we talk bitter pit and honey crisp, we're very focused on calcium for good right, but that vascular tissue of that apple needs zinc for development. So earlier on, we do not want to be deficient on zinc. We want adequate zinc in the fruit so we get good vascular tissue, so we get good movement of that calcium into the fruit and throughout the fruit. So zinc plays a role with bitter pit in Honeycrisp. So does phosphorus for that matter. Phosphorus drives cell division. If we're stretching, when we're bulking those Honeycrisp cells, and if we're bulking them, and they're not stretching as much because we've had more cell division because of phosphorus um, providing for that cell division, that's a good thing. Also on var varieties that tend to have a size challenge issue like Gala, if we can make sure that the fruit has adequate phosphorus, that means we've got more cells for bulking and we're gonna end up with larger fruit. So these are some of the things we look at. There are just like any other type of sampling, some protocols to follow when we're doing fruit analysis. They're not difficult. Um, they're easy to walk through. Again, um, your, your Lakeside team can certainly help you do that if you're interested in fruit analysis at harvest. We do like to analyze the entire apple uh, in everything but the stem and seed. We're not just taking a core or a slice or a peel. I find those very much shortcomings. Calcium in storage can wick out from the core 
into the rest of the apple. So we need to look at the whole apple, including the core, when we're evaluating how well that apple's going to do uh, from a shelf life to a storage and through disease internal breakdown and, and, and bitter pit. Um, so we need to look at the whole apple. So we typically sample the whole apple minus stem and seed within one to two weeks of harvest. The closer to harvest, the better. So at the end of the day, um, each farm is unique. The principles behind the five R's will help guide you. I would encourage you to review your nutrient needs. We usually start, as I said earlier, we start with a soil sample. That kind of helps us set the stage of what's needed for the season because it tells us what's in the ground, what we have to work with. Then we can do sap analysis through the season to monitor the, and, and adjust the fertility program as we go through the season. And then we do that fruit analysis at the end of the season as that report card. How did we do? Um, what does the packing house need to do? No, do we got a fruit that's going to be prone to bitter pit or prone to internal breakdown? Or do I got a good firm fruit that should do well in storage? So that can impact whether I want to see that fruit go on the, on the fresh market versus storage. Um, and it also is that report card for next year. What can we do better next year? So utilize the science tools, the science that's out there, the tools that are out there to drive those five R's of plant nutrition. And that's what I call science-driven nutrition. Thank you. I hope I didn't go too long there, Friedhelm. No, you're just perfect. You're just great. <laughs> So now we have a couple minutes for um, questions. So. They all um, you silenced them all. My goodness. Um, okay, I have a few questions actually. Yes, go ahead. Uh, for, first off, with uh, bitter pit and honey crisp, are you saying it's much more important to get? The calcium on earlier than later, not so much as the fruit is sizing, but to get it on ahead of that? Uh, absolutely. Um, it's, I mean, both are important. I don't want to say one is more or less important than the other, but to get calcium into the fruit, I'm saying you have to do it earlier. Um, if you're trying to move calcium into the fruit, which is what we're trying to do for bitter pit, you have to layer it onto that fruit as that, as that fruit cell division is taking place. And that is from fruit set to four to six weeks post petal fall. That is the time to get calcium into the fruit. After that, those calcium sprays, you might get a little bit into that outer skin, but very marginal. You're not going to get calcium into the fruit beyond four to six weeks post petal fall. But we do want to keep that calcium that's in the fruit there. And that's why we do those maintenance applications. But yeah, if you want to get calcium into the fruit for Honeycrisp, you need to start those sprays during bloom um, to make, and then keep right through until four to six weeks post petal fall, be very diligent and aggressive on those, on those calcium applications. And again, how many really depends on whether I'm having a drier year or wetter year, because the calcium's coming in with the water, right? And also one uh, sort of a saying that's been quite known out this way is sink at pink. And I noticed you didn't mention sink at all during that time. Um, yeah, zinc is needed a bit earlier than pink. Uh, zinc is more of a tight cluster. Uh, zinc is, we, we certainly want to be ramping up zinc coming into bloom, but it's also needed earlier than that. So I put my zinc in at tight cluster so that it's ramped up and there in time for bloom. Okay, and then another question about putting on, like we do as best we can putting on the nutrients for uh, getting set for the winter, as you said, yep. with an early variety like Paula Red or an early Mac, mm -hmm. you basically, should you put it on basically once you've finished harvesting those apples or should you wait a little bit later? Or is, does it matter if you get it on like early September and it still stays warm? It actually really does matter. That's an excellent question. Um, yeah, I like to wait uh, till if, if we're in a, a, an extended, long, warmer spell in September, I like to wait till the end of that. We certainly don't want to see those nutrients metabolized. We want them to stay in the wood and in the bud. Um, and it doesn't take long after a good foliar application for the nutrient to get in there. So absolutely, if you're, if you're early September and September is warm and beautiful, um, going on later September would be much more of an advantage. Okay, Absolutely. I just want 
one last question. I, I, did I correct, hear you correctly that you mentioned you don't want to be putting seaweed on when you're trying to get like a, basically a month, give or take pre-harvest, whereas we've been told that actually the seaweed product we use is supposed to help with color. Hmm. Um, if it's nodosum, it's not going to help with color. It's going to hinder color. And to my knowledge, there's a, there's a maximum species that comes out of South Africa that's, that's a bit different. But the majority of the product I've seen in Canada has been nodosum. And nodosum inhibits uh, fruit color. It inhibits ethylene production and inhibits fruit color. Um, so once we start seeing fruit color, I tell farmers that are applying nodosum seaweed products foliar to actually take them out of the program. Otherwise, you will slow down that fruit color. Now, if you're trying to slow down that fruit color because you're trying to schedule picking and harvest dates, um, you know, you can certainly do that with seaweed. Um, but I, you know, prefer you use products like Retain that are, are, are registered and labeled for it. But absolutely, nodosum seaweed inhibits ethylene production and will inhibit color. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Good questions. Thank you. Do we have anything further? <clears throat> Don't see anything in the chat. Well, if there's any questions coming afterwards, so uh, you you just submit it to us or call me or uh, Nicole or um, Anita, not yet, <laughs> but um, uh, you can call or email or text or whatever you do. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, one last question here. Uh, go ahead, um, oh, good question, Rob. I, I wanted to ask, what are your thoughts about putting nutrients on with fungicides, insecticides, PGRs, etc.? Do you recommend them on their own or do you rec is it fine to put any of those products in with them? Um, certainly when I look at, I mean, certainly um, tank, tank mix compatibility is a huge issue. So I'll say off the front, you certainly want to do a jar test to ensure. Uh, but there are many fungicides uh, and insecticides um, that are tank mix friendly. Uh, with nutritional products, and quite frankly, with the amount of with the amount of pest pressure, whether it's disease or insect pressure, that you face in Ontario, I don't think it's realistic to say nutrients go on separately. You barely have enough time to get everything on. You've got to embrace tank mixing of some sort. Um, but there are some some general rules to play when you are tank mixing. Um, if you have acidic fertilizers, um, and a lot of our products tend to be more acidic. Um, you would like to see those in the tank earlier, not later, um, so that they can buffer that water pH. A lot of the chemistries that go in the tank, I, I ask farmers to consider putting them in at the end when the tank is almost completely full. Remember, dilution is our friend, so we want lots of water in the tank between, between items to help, help things along and not, not to create reactions. And the reason I say those chemistries in towards the end of the tank mix uh, is because those acidic fertilizers can then have a period of time to buffer that uh, react and buffer that pH, stabilize that tank pH before you put the pesticide in. Because you don't want to see a lot of pH shift in the tank. Once that pesticide gets in there, we're trying to avoid chemical hydrolysis. A lot of the newer products are quite stable at various pH values in the, in the, in the spray tank, but not all of them are. So I like to see the chemistries go in at the end. So there are some, some orders to what goes in the tank. Um, but unfortunately, I think tank mixing is just a reality for your market. You'll never get everything applied otherwise. Great. All right. Thank you very much. And two excellent presentations. Oh, well, thank you very much, Ravi. All the best. Glad to hear that feedback. Um, okay. There's no other question. Then we are just thanking very much. Uh, lo lots of thanks to you, Rick. For getting up so early and I hope we can get your breakfast in between <laughs> and uh, thank you for your presentation that was wonderful and I'm pretty sure we will hear some uh, feedback I just had some feedback uh, from another grower on the chat line and it says great information thank you very much thank you so uh, that's what we want to hear I, um, unfortunately I do have to depart, depart now freedom but again if there's any questions Please facilitate and get them through to me. You, you, you have will. my contact. We will. Thank you so much, Rick. And um, we go to the next, and that's uh, Nicole. You keep going. All right. So next up, we have Sean Brenneman and Patricia Clofer. Sean is our rep uh, for our territory in Lindsay, Middlesex, and Elgin. 
And Patricia is our specialty veg and spud rep. So I will hand it over to you guys. Great, thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Reed Helm, and, and thank the rest of the Lakeside team for pulling this session together. Uh, like Nicole said, I'm Sean Brenneman, your local territory sales rep with Syngenta, and I cover Elgin, Middlesex, Lambton counties, basically London to Sarnia. I've been with Syngenta in various roles for the last 15 years and was in ag retail for 10 years before that. And my wife and I, we live uh, just north of the big metropolis of Alvinston. Uh, and so if anybody ever wants to get together to talk about products or farming, Armour's Dale House, Riverstone Pizza, or Stone Pickers are some of my favorite hangout spots. And go to the next slide, please. I always like to start with, with this slide at, at a meeting. And this is our Hort portfolio. And actually, there's a lot of other products in here. But really, I just want to say thank you to all of you for any of you that have bought products listed here and for choosing Syngenta to be a partner in your business. It's, uh, I know, you know, farming is not getting any easier. We all know that uh, land, input pricing, labor, government policies, information technology. I mean, there's so much more that goes into farming today than just growing a crop. And when you buy some of these products from Syngenta, you're not only getting something to help protect and grow today's crop, but you also help us reinvest in research and development programs and policies that will hopefully provide the solutions for, for crops and generations in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, next slide. And believe it or not, I don't provide all these solutions alone. There's a really big team that supports me in the field. Uh, some of the support comes from the other territory reps and you see them on the left side of the screen there. So if there's a rep down in Essex, Stephanie, who's working with some apple growers down there, or maybe Matt Underwood up in the Collingwood area, uh, Brian Woolley down in Niagara. There's a lot of other reps in other areas that I work with very closely to get questions to answers, to get answers to questions that maybe uh, I don't know myself. So we work very closely as a team. We also get a lot of support from our chemical services group and pathology lab in Plattsville, Ontario. And, and there they can test for things like Rick was saying with the compatibility of product mixes that you might wanna use in the farm, or they can even grow out and identify diseases that they find in soil or plants. Some of the support also comes from our marketing group uh, at our head office in Guelph, which provides me with lots of hats and gloves and cool items like uh, this uh, toque with a, I'm not even sure you can see, it's a toque with a light built right into the hat there. They provide me with stuff like that, but they also pull together things like this quick reference guide. And uh, this is our palm fruit quick reference guide. And all of you on the call today will receive one of these in the mail. We also have quick reference guides for all other crops out there, whether it's corn, beans, wheat, uh, fruiting vegetable, grapes, uh, melons, cucurbits, et cetera, et cetera. So if you need any additional crop resource guides, please reach out directly to myself or to the Lakeside team and we'll get that sent to you. And lastly, the, the probably in my mind, the biggest resource I have available to work with is our next presenter, Patricia Clover, who, as Nicole said, is the Hort Specialist for Southwestern Ontario and my go-to for those really tough burning technical questions. So with that, Patricia, take it away. Awesome, thanks so much, Sean. As Sean mentioned, I am the Horticulture Specialist. My title's changed again. It's kind of fun every year announcing my new title, but. The joy of my job now is that I don't cover the whole province. I essentially stop at Highway 6 and service everything west. So the area that Lakeside covers um, and where their physical locations are for sure, all the way down to Essex. So looking forward to doing just as much driving, but in a smaller area, a little bit closer to home. You'll see on the screen, as Sean mentioned, we have another horticulture specialist. His name is Eric, and he is looking after more of the east side of the province. So. He lives um, just outside of Hamilton, Ontario, and so that's kind of the line, the Highway 6 line that I mentioned. He's looking after folks north and west of there. So Eric just joined our sales team January 1st. He's been with our company for 16 years. A lot of his time has been spent in product supply and management. So very familiar with our portfolio, has heard a lot about apples. He will be spending time in grapes and potatoes. Those are his top three crops. And um, we'll be supporting each other uh, throughout the year. So with that, I'm going to see if I can run the poll. 
that I, here we go. So the first question you'll see before we get started today is about Allegro. There's a tool in our toolbox called Allegro. Most people have heard about it. Usually I get up every year and put one slide up and talk about Allegro and that's about it. This year, hoping I will talk a little bit more about it. We're doing a lot more work with Allegro going forward just because of how it fits. And we'll talk about some of that today so that when um, we're really looking to use possibly that tool next year in our Apple programs, we're very well prepared. So if questions come to you today, please ask them in the chat or at the end, please ask. And as we're developing a few new techniques to use Allegro with, we'd like to take your input and include that as well. So when it comes to folks using Allegro, awesome, the audience, 86% of you have used Allegro in apples, which is awesome. Um, different parts of the province use Allegro different ways. And so some of that we will, I can get this to stop. Some of that we'll see kind of as we talk through today. The second part of the question that I've put up there now is where do you use Allegro or where do you think Allegro has the biggest fit? This will help us in turn, like I mentioned, talk about some of the different ways we can use Allegro and develop, mimic what you guys are doing in the field and ladies are doing in the field. Just give you another minute there. Stop the polling and just share a little bit there. So there's some folks that use it primarily for disease in summer, looking after your black rot, fly speck, city blotch. Some people use it a little bit both for scab early and for the summer diseases. And there's a few folks that are hoping to learn more or I'm interpreting <laughs> that they wanna learn more today. So we'll start off with a little bit of the apple review and the leg row talk that I've mentioned and then for those that grow other tree fruit, just a quick snippet of something new that we have to offer you for 2021. As Sean mentioned, we have the quick reference guides and I'll refer to them again later at the end. And this is just a snapshot of our story or for product portfolio for apples and palm fruit. You can see that it hasn't changed over the 2020 version or even 2019 but we're pretty happy with our stable portfolio with apples and we're always looking at new ways to use the products that we have registered and bettering our knowledge on them. Today we'll spend, as I've mentioned a couple times now, a little bit more time on Allegro. Before we get there, talk a little bit about Inspire Super or just rub the dust off of your knowledge on that product. <clears throat> Excuse me. You'll remember Inspire Super is a premixed product. It has two active ingredients in it. The first is diphenaconazole. Yes, that is a group three. And we've mixed it with a group nine called Ciprodinol. You can see at the chart at the bottom of this slide, there's a few reasons we've mixed these two different chemistries together. The first is because they both have preventative and very early curative activity. About two days is what we talk about for curative or 48 hours. And then they move very differently. So diphenaconazole moves very quickly into the leaf and provides systemic control from the inside out. And then the group nine also moves into leaf tissue and it moves a little bit faster to the ends of the leaf than our group three. So with those two products, both moving into leaf tissue, providing disease control, but moving slightly differently, we're seeing excellent control of scab especially and suppression of powdery mildew. You'll see that we have a bit of a rate range there um, again, with most products, as your pressure increases, we'd like you to increase your rate as well. However, if we are using this product tight cluster um, into pink or half inch green into pink when we have some leaf tissue there to protect, we do want to go that high rate on if we want powdery mildew control. You might want to add a little bit of sulfur to that as well on risky varieties when it comes to powdery mildew, something like Honeycrisp, for example, just to make sure that we've tightened that up if the conditions are right. And again, using this primarily during the beginning of the season, so the pre-harvest intervals and re-entry intervals are very easy to abide with there. 
How we'd like to really see this product used is back-to-back -back sprays, which I know we don't like to talk about in apples, but we're doing a lot more work with resistance management, specifically according to the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee rules, which you can go on their website, it's across the bottom of the screen there, and you can see about the different resistance suggestions when you're using different products for apple scabs specifically. So those fungicide resistance guidelines that FRAC has put out, it says that we're, we should only keep to four group three products over the whole season for apple scabs. And that's just to ensure that we're keeping products alive in our toolbox and preventing resistance to the best of our ability. Sometimes when we mix products, like Inspire Super is mixed with a group nine, we see a bit more leniency to use a little bit more of a certain active ingredient over the course of the year. We don't have time to go over all of that today. It's pretty confusing. It makes your head spin for the first few minutes when you look at it, but I highly encourage you to go look at the FRAC guidelines that are online. And again, it's an independent committee. There are reps from different chemical companies on there um, just to make sure that we're protecting our own chemistry, but it is an independent group that's setting guidelines in order to keep ahead of resistance globally. When it comes to a Provia top, You'll remember that this is a group seven SDHI product, solatinol or Provia, mixed with that group three, diphenaconazole. And we keep this for our pink through bloom spray. That's where we like to use our group sevens as an industry. It's a bit of a unsaid rule that we keep our group sevens for that time, just because of how well they work on group, on scab and on powdery mildew. A Provia top does offer excellent control of both of those diseases. Sometimes I find that we get so concerned about scab that we forget about the temperatures that powdery mildew requires. And sometimes we need to just make sure we're on top of our powdery mildew timing as well. So whether it's a Proviotop or a different product over that bloom time, make sure that you're not just thinking about scab, but that you're thinking about your other disease, powdery mildew as well at that time and for when you're trying to time your sprays. Primarily, we'd be using this product early, again, because it's a group seven and we only, as an industry, talk about using two over the whole course of the season for apple scabs to keep resistance at bay. And with that, our reentry intervals and our pre-harvest intervals aren't a, aren't a concern at all. When we compare the two products that we've put together, that Salatinol piece or Aprovia piece and that Diphenaconazole piece or Inspire piece, again, moves slightly differently within the plant. That salatinol piece binds very quick to the wax layer of the leaf, which gives it residual control of, on diseases like apple scab and powdery mildew, and then it moves into the leaf. Meanwhile, that group three moves a little bit faster into the leaf and protects more from the inside of the leaf out. The reason we've put group seven and group three together, a lot about resistance is coming out of my mouth this morning, and that's just because group sevens and group threes show develop resistance in different ways. And we believe that putting a group three, which has a bit of a slower build to resistance in with this group seven, it better protects that chemistry. Now to the piece that I'm a little bit more excited to talk about. Allegro is our group 29 fungicide. It's the only active ingredient that's in that group, very unique, and it provides reliable and different mode of action on diseases that we're tackling quite often in apples. According to the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee that I keep mentioning, this is a very low risk group, partially because there's not many things in that group, Allegro is the only thing, and because of how it works on the actual fungal cells themselves. You'll remember for those who've used it that Allegro is a liquid formulation, which is very nice to work with. And it's a broad spectrum contact fungicide. So when we're looking at other broad spectrum con contact fungicides that we work with, Manzate or Diathane is one of them, something like Captan would be another. And so when we think about using Allegro, depending on what disease we're going after, we want to use it similar to how we use those other products. The layering of product is important as tissue expands and grows because this product doesn't move within that new tissue stays where it is, and then redistributes slowly with a little bit of rain, very similar to those other products that have been mainstays in our program. You'll see with Allegro that 0.5 to 1 liter per hectare rate is a very big range. 
again, that depends a little bit on what we're going after, and I'll explain that in the next two slides. I'd say the major watch out with Allegro is the long pre-harvest interval. We do have to keep that a bit from when we're harvesting. So when it comes to summer sprays, we'd usually, usually use it towards the front end of our summer sprays. It's a bit of a longer re-entry interval, um, but again, broad spectrum. So hopefully it means we're spraying a little bit less and we can use up to nine applications a year. I will mention using nine applications per year is a stretch. Um, it's not very likely that we'll have all nine of those applications and really it's not great resistance management even with this group being by itself to use it that often. The other thing I should mention is there is a, a skin sensitizing product in Allegro. Um, for those that grow other crops, Bravo is very similar. And so that is just one thing to keep an eye on. If you're going in right after those three days, it might be helpful to wear gloves or something like that just to be extra safe with your workers. When we're using Allegro for early season scab control, you can see that rate range holds true there. Um, in most studies that I've looked at, we're looking at that 200 mils doing a great job, assuming that there's moderate to low scab pressure. In the study that's in the graph on the right hand side, they had, this is in a trial orchard, so where they do fungicide trials every year. And they had untreated trees on either side that were full of scab. So I would say it's higher pressure but even looking at what's going on there in that graph, older varieties, older study, but we're still seeing excellent control both on the leaves and on the fruit using Allegro at the low and high rate. Again, pressure would be the biggest dependent for what rate you might choose to go at with Allegro. Should also mention that Allegro does not cover powdery mildew, so we'd still have to do something for powdery at the same time. We're looking at doing some trials to check tank mix compatibility and phyto actually for this year. We know Allegro mix as well. It's just the phyto piece that we're looking to check into 2021. When it comes to summer spray use, we have a wide label on this one. I didn't include everything, just the main diseases that we get in Ontario. And again, I've seen some excellent data and heard excellent results using this, particularly for fly speck and sooty blotch early, just after bloom and when we get those wetting hours that we require for the diseases to develop there. The black rot suppression, I get a lot of questions about this one every year with Allegro. It's suppression because it seems to be a little bit dependent on what variety you put it on as well. I've seen different studies where we've seen 90% control and other varieties that where black rot is really an issue where we see just 60%. So that's why it's a suppression on the label. If you have a variety that's more tolerant to black rot, you'd be very happy with how Allegro performs in that orchard. If you have something that's very susceptible, like galas, you seem to see a bit more on, or I have in my travels, you know, you might want to make sure you're using that high rate and spraying appropriately for that disease. We also sometimes talk about mite suppression with this product. In some of the studies where they just did efficacy, so sprayed Allegro every week, we saw a good suppression of mites over the course of the season. And again, it's a bit of a deterrent more than anything. It's not actually killing the mites, um, it's just keeping them off the leaves. So again, as a summer spray, it's a bit of a hidden benefit. Plus you're not dealing with dusty products as your loaded sprayers. So that was the snippet on our apple crop story. Um, again, if you have a couple suggestions for tank mixes, I'll just go through this next little bit quickly and then we'd love to hear them. Um, but looking forward to working more with people using Allegro a little bit more going forward with its broad range of activity and the different diseases it goes after. Very quickly on stone fruit. I know there's a few people here that have that in their orchard as well for a side project or um, maybe because it's just really tasty. We have a new product for 2021 called Miravis Duo. And this is an exciting new product. If you have some row crops around or maybe your neighbor grows some wheat, you may have seen a big splash about a product that we have called Miravis Ace. Or on corn, we have another one called Miravis um, Neo. So there's a whole suite of Miravis products, and this is the one particularly for tree fruit, well, stone fruit at this point, and hazelnuts. 
And we also have a different product that would be used more on berries. But for sake of time, we'll talk about this one a little bit today. So what is Miravis Duo? Miravis Duo, again, is mixed with our favorite product, Diphenaconazole, group three product. And it's also a brand new active ingredient that we call adepidin. What it does is it com Miravis Duo combines those two chemistries, one's a proven chemistry with broad spectrum systemic control of different diseases with a brand new powerful active ingredient that we hope makes your programs a little more simple and a little less stressful. What is special about this Miravis molecule? Syngenta launched a Provia top not too long ago in apples. You know, why are we bringing another group seven, group three mix to the market? This Miravis molecule or adepidin as we call it is pretty special. It has three different parts to it. The first being the power piece. So that is what gives us the spectrum of control that we see with all group sevens. All group sevens have that little light blue piece on the left on them. And that's what makes them an SDHI. If we move over to the far right side of the picture of the molecule, that purple piece, that's a lithophilic part. So that's what gives us stamina and retention of product, residual activity on a lot of diseases. It binds very strongly to the wax layer of the leaf and, and moves into the rest of the leaf to provide control from there. This middle piece of Miravis is what we call the most special part of the molecule. It's different than any other group seven. It's actually put adepidin in its own little subclass of group sevens, which is pretty cool. And with that, we've noticed that there's a decreased risk of cross resistance to other group sevens. This is what gives us the spectrum of control. So whether it's something like botrytis or scab, uh, peach scab or powdery mildew, we have very good control on those diseases as well as fusarium and other tougher to control white mold diseases. So again, just mentioning the top kind of buckets of diseases that we get with this molecule. The first one is powdery mildew and that's across a few different crops. We also see excellent and game-changing results on some leaf spots, especially alternarias. And then we also see good control of botrytis and again, decreasing that resistance risk with that group. So I mentioned the adepidin binds to that wax leaf. So when we spray it, we try to cover as much of that leaf as we can. And then it binds very quickly to that leaf and then moves into the wax layer. Adepidin likes to sit in that wax layer. It's almost like rain sitting in a rain barrel. I'm just waiting there to protect that leaf. Over time, some of that product moves from that wax layer, from that rain barrel into the rest of the leaf tissue. And that's what gives us protection also on the inside of the leaf itself from diseases that might move and spread within the leaf. We do see slow xylem systemity with this product as well, which means that it will move out to the tips of the leaves as they grow over time. So when it comes to a practical standpoint of where we're going to use this product in 2021, you can see stone fruit and tree nuts are on this label particularly. There's a bunch of other product or crops on this label as well, but these are the ones that we'll talk a little bit about today. The one thing we kept nice and easy with Miravis products is regardless of the crop or the disease you're going after, 0.4 liters per acre is what we'll talk about as a rate. Again, excellent pre-harvest intervals, especially on stone fruit a zero day pre-harvest, only a 12 hour re-entry. So it would be a great product for use, especially something like cherries where you might have a heavy storm or something go through and need to spray something to make sure you're covered on any brown rot that might sneak in. When would we apply it? From a syngenta standpoint, we see two fits for the product. The first is at bloom. And the second would be for your summer or cover sprays, as I mentioned, especially towards the end of harvest where you need something that you can keep harvesting and isn't going to hang you up. A little bit of data here, um, as with new products brought forward by um, the chemical companies that are here today, we have data that um, shows that this product does what it's supposed to do. And that's protect crops from harmful diseases. And they do a a darn good job at it as well. So you can see when we look at the Miravis Duo at that standard rate compared to different products. So this is a bit of a mix of a bunch of different competitor products. We're doing as good of a job as what the industry expects a product applied at this time should do. 
you'll notice the standard error bars, those are the little tiny gray eyes on the bars. They're pretty small. And that means that we have all of our data that's showing consistent results over time. When we look at SCAB, you'll see very similar results again, excellent control of SCAB and peaches, um, again, against multiple different programs and over a couple different years. I'll leave you with that little teaser for now. And as we're just finishing up, um, mention the quick reference guide. So again, Sean showed you this one. This is our palm fruit one. It has the spray schedule there at the bottom, all of our products listed on the back, the pre-harvest intervals, the rate. Um, it does include PCP numbers now, so it's a little bit easier to just grab that when you're filling out your Canada Gap work. We also have strawberry, blueberry, cucurbit. There's 12 of them in total. So please reach out to Sean or myself or your Lakeside crew, and we'll make sure we get you some hard copies if you'd like. With that, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you, folks. Nicole, are you on? I don't see any questions yet in the chat. Um, give them another minute. Anyone? Maybe I'll ask a question that I kind of asked at the beginning there. For those that maybe are looking to use a little bit more Allegro going forward um, with some of the different reevaluations that we've seen and that are slowly coming to the market, we're looking at doing some phyto work with oil um, mixed with Allegro to see what might happen if we put them in the same tank on different varieties. We're also looking at mixing it with sulfur so that either way you have something there for some powdery mildew control. Is there any other main ones that this group might like to see in the tank with that if we're doing some phyto testing? Just like to ask a question about the suppression of European red mites. Sure thing, Robbie. Um, you were saying to spray it basically on a weekly basis to have suppression on European red mites. So like we usually do on, sometimes we'll do a program where we'll go oil, allegro, like each other week. So in that case, is it not going to have as much effect in that situation? No, sorry. I spoke too quickly there. So what they did in that trial that I was referring to is they only sprayed Allegro. They had one oil early in the season, but didn't do anything else for mite control all year. And they saw good mite control just from spraying Allegro on a once a week basis um, okay. as a bit of a mite program. So no, um, to answer your question, still would expect to see the suppression in a program like you're talking about. Okay, okay. thank you. All right, any more questions? Oh, there's one. Um, the oil sensitivity is very important. It would be a great study, is what Brian Rideout said. Um, more of a comment, I guess. <laughs> All right, if there's no other questions, I guess that wraps up our meeting. We are going to do a giveaway though. Oh, wait a second, Patricia. There's a question here. Um, any chance of Miravis Duo being registered for apples? It's, we've had a couple people ask. I keep giving that feedback back to our marketing group. Um, hopefully our new product lead, Jeanette, will be looking at that going forward. But um, for 2021, not at this time for apples, no. Thanks. All right.